I was really lucky growing up in Edmonton to be growing up in a family that appreciated um, literature and, and fine art and the sort of social role it could play. Um, my mom was a teacher who was interested in, in teaching through theater and they got us busy in um, the summers doing things like art classes at the Edmonton Art Gallery, now the Alberta Gallery of Art, but at the time Edmonton Art Gallery, um, which ran various teaching programs for kids. Um, and also, I, was <laughs> I, I started off with um, an art program that was run out of a little office by a man, Mr. Sheppy, Mr. Shepansky's art class. Um, and he was sort of of the academic tradition where you learn to, to draw and then paint from busts and things like that. Only he didn't have much in the way, way of equipment, so he had little china figurines, <laughs> which is sort of where I started, which is kind of funny to think at the time. Um, so I was interested from a child, really, um, and just got a lot of support. Growing up in Edmonton was great. In the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of um, support for arts education, art programs, the art gallery had a, a really interesting collection, mostly of kind of abstract art. Um, and so I was really interested in a range of from historical to contemporary things. Um, and that got me interested. My parents sent me to the Banff Center um, when I just graduated from um, uh, high school. And they ran a summer program then for students, recently graduated high school students. Um, and it was, it was fantastic. Suddenly, after having had a horrible time in high school, um, I found people that kind of yeah, I clicked with, um, all these crazy artists and dancers and theater people and uh, musicians. And so it was that kind of wonderful blend of activities that got me involved. So that really showed me that there was a way to be an artist in the world and that it was a viable profession. From looking at other art, so I love looking at art partly um, because I'm seeing, I'm seeing things people have made from different times and places and the sort of great diversity of things that you can see um, from historical to contemporary art. A lot of the things that I, I encounter now are through my teaching. So I do a lot of research for teaching, a lot of research about contemporary art. Mm -hmm. I'm also really fascinated by our relationships with the natural world. So I do a lot of hiking now, although I, did, I didn't before, but maybe going to Banff was part of that. Um, I've always been interested in our relationships with animals, with gardens and with the wilderness, so-called in quotes wilderness, um, and how we relate to those kinds of things. I'm very fortunate to have uh, a position where I'm, my work is about the thing that I love to do. And so I get to have these fabulous conversations every day with my colleagues and, and students about art, about painting. And so I think that there's a, there's a kind of a, a cycle of energy that inspires me. Well, um, oftentimes it, my themes are about painting or, or, or about art itself. So oftentimes the paintings are about the history of painting. Um, but oftentimes animal life, elements of nature, um, and the way that we look at those things, the way we think about who we are in relation to animals, who we are in relation to nature. One thing I think about with the show that's on right now, um, with the, the paintings of the dog figurines, they're representatives of how we relate to animals, but they're also representatives of, of what it means to make something. So they were made by um, workers who were often women, young children um, in the Victorian period and were really exploited in terms of their labor. Um, 
the working conditions they were producing these figurines in, in the potteries, were um, very unhealthy. Uh, they worked long hours, and it was often very, very um, strenuous work. So I'm curious there about, for example, how something that was created under such strain and tension um, and, and really difficult situation ends up becoming an object that's passed around on an auction site on the internet for huge sums of money um, and acquired by people who are obsessed with this kind of um, acquisition of objects. So in this case, the subject on the surface seems to be dog figurines, but in fact it, it has to do with um, our relationship to objects that are produced, um, the kind of value that's attached to labor and work, um, and how that all gets changed through time and, and through media like the internet. I work largely with painting. I mean, painting is one of the things that, that I enjoy the most. But I've worked in, in, by combining painting with objects in installation contexts, um, sometimes painting floors, for example, uh, or walls. I, I think about um, painting is not simply about making what we think of as, as um, fine art. But it's, it's also an activity that we do when we paint our houses, for example. So, so paint as a, painting as a process and paint as a material is something that is not just about fine art. It's, it's about our relationship with things in the world. When I'm working with oil paint, which is um, one of the things I enjoy the most, I, I love how the material itself, the colors and, and the, the substance of the paint seems to carry with it lots of historical meaning and, and it's, it's so changeable, you can sort of make anything out of this. So the colors, for example, um, oftentimes they'll, they'll refer to elements in the natural world or to um, places, so for example, uh, burnt sienna, it comes from Siena in Italy, uh, burnt umber from Umbria, so thinking about the earth there. Um, indigo, the history of indigo has to do with the dyeing of, of plants and, and um, the value of different colors for, we think about, uh, for example, blue jeans are indigo. Um, that was the color of workers' clothing. So color and materials, whether it's paint, pigment, dye, um, they themselves are, are inspiring and fascinating. The process I've used in this particular series in, in the show here at Kelowna is a little different for me in that it's um, not about creating an image through the process, but rather I've simply set myself the challenge of translating um, an image that's a digital photograph <laughs> of a real object um, from looking at a computer screen um, into these um, simple rectangular formats, not unlike the size of the computer screen itself. And so it's a kind of a, a rote translation in a way with not a lot of room um, for creativity or invention. And it was important to me to set it as a difficult task that was about endurance in a way, a kind of a perseverance, almost to the point of absurdity, like, why do this? Um, I guess that starts to talk a little bit about labor and work and how we find meaning in any kind of work that we do, especially the difficult, boring stuff that we do over and over and over. Um, and so one of the surprising things about um, this process for me was how it became a meditative process. I could, I could paint with one part of my brain shut off, another part of the brain 
listening to Netflix while thinking at the same time about the making of these objects? Well, I hope that they are kind of intrigued by the sheer variety um, and similarity of these, these objects that some people may know about, um, some people may be collectors of, of objects, uh, of all sorts of different things. I mean, the, the urge to collect um, is a very strong one. So I hope that they maybe th res that, that thinking about what it means to collect something resonates with them. I hope that people might begin to ask questions about how we relate to the objects that get created and possessed, how, how painting functions as one of those objects. Um, I think for a lot of people, they may simply be thinking about our relationship with dogs, with animals. Um, it seems like our entire world right now is composed of internet images of pets. So, <laughs> so perhaps they'll think a little bit about how that relationship is, has changed. I know when people look at the large collection of, of paintings in the, in the exhibition, oftentimes they'll, they'll try to create stories behind them. Um, they'll see maybe some of the, the um, interactions between the two figurines because they're always sort of paired. So the, the dog figures might stand in for people as we think about our relationships with siblings or partners. Um, and also they kind of they're, they're like places where you can project your ideas and stories onto. And so I hope that maybe people begin to think a little bit about how their imaginations activate these, these kind of vessels, if you will.